Hi there, I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. On today's podcast, we're talking about sugar, how damaging it is to your health, and what you can do to effectively balance your blood sugar for optimal wellness. This is so important for the health of your skin and the health of your body to help prevent and address many chronic diseases that are so common today. My guest is Dr. Rita Marie, who is passionately committed to transforming exhausted high achievers all around the globe into high energy people who love their lives and live in their full potential. Sounds pretty great, right? So she founded the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology and specializes in using the wisdom of nature married with modern scientific research to restore balance to hormones. Rita Marie is a licensed doctor of chiropractic with certification in acupuncture and is a a diplomat of the American Clinical Nutrition Board. She is certified clinical nutritionist with a master's degree in human nutrition and has completed a 500-hour herbal medicine certification program. In today's interview, we discuss how imbalances in your blood sugar are related to how you look and feel, including the health of your skin. And again, so many diseases are related to imbalances in blood sugar. So we're going to talk about that today. And Dr. Rita Marie shares her top tips for reducing sugar intake and balancing blood sugar for optimal health and longevity. She has great experience with doing this and shares some valuable tools in in today's interview. So please enjoy this interview. Rita Marie, it's great to have you on my podcast. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. I love what you're doing in the world. We love your products and we love that you're approaching it from a standpoint of um, helping people to, to take care of themselves naturally and put all those chemicals and hormone disruptors and all those other things in their faces and their skin. So yeah, I love what you're doing and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great. All right. So we're focusing on sugar today, talking a lot about sugar and imbalances in sugar. Now, I know that there are some people out there, quite a few people actually, that think if they're not trying to lose weight, they don't have to worry about sugar. Like that's really, it's just about weight loss. But you and I know there's a lot more involved Mm -hmm. in the impact that sugar has on and imbalances in blood sugar have on our health. So absolutely. So what, you know, what is your take on sugar? So when I, when you say sugar, I'm thinking blood sugar, but there's sugar as far as what people should eat. And I'm just going to say my take on it is they shouldn't, you know, because sugar is just not a real food and we should be eating real foods that nourish the body. If we want to have healthy skin, we want to have healthy hormones that we need to have balance in the body. We need to have the right nutrients. We need to have our blood sugar managed nice and steady because blood sugar actually controls all the rest of the the hormones, which people don't realize either. So eating sugar is like, it's obsolete, it's old fashioned. We don't do that anymore in in this world where we're educated. Um, And then in the world of fasting and keto diets, and people are much more aware of the impact of sugar paleo diets, all of these diets that just really skew people away. So eating sugar is is not a good thing. It's It's just pure calories. And I don't care whether you need to lose weight or not. And if you need to gain weight, eating sugar is not the way to do it. There are other ways to do it. Right, right. And and so we're, we'll talk about alternatives to sugar and what people can do. But let's talk about blood sugar and and what what it, what creates imbalances in blood sugar because it's not just about eating sugar, right? No, it's about so much more. And and I think it's like one of the most overlooked hormone imbalances in medicine today, even in naturopathic medicine today, that people just go, oh, yeah, you're fine. You know, your fasting blood sugar is, uh, you know, below 90 or below 100, whatever, and you're fine. And everybody gets that tested on their annual you know, blood scans, regardless of the, the doctor. But we know that fasting blood sugar is not a good indicator that you have an imbalance in the way your body processes sugar. And the way your body processes sugar impacts everything in the system. It impacts cardiovascular health, it impacts skin health, it impacts liver, it impacts blood pressure, it puts you at a risk for cancer if it's not balanced, Alzheimer's. So it's this, it's this global thing that people are overlooking until they have a disease called diabetes, the D diagnosis, right? And they think they don't have to worry about it because the doctor said they're fine. And I have seen people who developed retinopathies 
lack of being able to see out of an eye because of sugar imbalances over the years that were not detected by conventional medicine, medical testing because their sugars were going up, but not in the morning. It was going up throughout the day and they got high enough to cause damage to the retinas. And those are known complications of diabetes, right? That somebody has diabetes, quote unquote, for a long time, they develop problems with their retinas, problems with their peripheral nerves, their numbness and tingling. But in reality, those changes are happening probably about 30 years before the diagnosis of diabetes. And it's just cumulative, cumulative. And a lot of people, in fact, the studies show that a good percentage, like close to 50% of the people who develop retinopathies don't even have blood sugar imbalances according to the way medicine diagnoses it. So I believe people need to take it into their own hands and figure out, do you have a blood sugar imbalance? Doesn't mean do you have diabetes? It doesn't mean do you have a disease? But is your blood sugar swinging in such a way that it's causing damage to the body throughout the years of your life and damage to the hormones. So a lot of people with thyroid imbalances, I just did a webinar on that. A lot of people with thyroid imbalances and year after year and they're changing their medication and just can't get it straightened out. It's because they have an underlying blood sugar imbalance that's not being addressed. So, so what do you recommend then for people to, to see, truly see if they have a blood sugar imbalance. Not that you're, they're just fine um, and that they're, they're, they don't have diabetes or prediabetes, but what, what, is it that you, um, what is it you recommend? Yeah, there's three main tests that I recommend that people get. Two of them can be done through the doctor and one they can do at home. Um, one of them is hemoglobin A1C, and most doctors don't run it unless you're diabetic already. Unfortunately, by the time they run it, it's way out of range. And it actually could be a much earlier predictor for a lot of people. It's not all 100%, but it definitely can be a predictor. The other thing I recommend is insulin. Get your fasting insulin levels going. Because if they start creeping up, that means you're overproducing a hormone called insulin and you're going to get into trouble. It's just a matter of when and you really should be addressing. And the third is what I call postprandial glucose mapping. It's a big mouthful, but it's basically where you buy yourself a little $15 device that helps you to measure your blood glucose at home. And you measure, what is it before your meal? How high does it go at the peak after your meal? How quickly does it come back down? Does it go down below the starting point and get you into a hypoglycemic type attack? And when you can map that out, wondrous magic things happen. I've done this, I've led thousands of people through a program where we teach people how to do this. And the changes are miraculous. And people go, I had no idea. I had no idea I had a blood sugar problem. And now that I've gotten this under control and mapped it out and changed my diet and lifestyle, not just diet, I am now like, I lost weight. I couldn't do it before. My blood pressure is down. Uh, one person reversed her Hashimoto's within four months of starting on getting her blood sugar balance. And she'd been on thyroid medication for 50 years. So miraculous things happen. Arthritis goes away. Fatty liver goes away. So it's really something that not 100% of people have, but you owe it to yourself to make sure that you don't before you just live your life in such a way that suddenly you're blind or you can't feel your feet or you've developed an autoimmune disease or cancer. Yeah, I love what you're talking about. It's really about being proactive. It's uh, The typical yes. conventional approach in medicine is to wait until we have a serious problem <sighs> and then address it. But then it's so much harder to treat it. Plus you're not living your life optimally. You're not feeling your best. If your blood yeah. sugar is out of balance, you're gonna have ups and downs in your in your energy and your mood and your food cravings and all yeah. of that. You yeah. don't have to live like that. And, and, if, and certainly it's not just about preventing diabetes. I mean, of course that is important, but there's so much else you can do. So I love this idea of being proactive and yeah, you might do these tests and find that everything's fine. fine. Yes, fantastic, right? But right? check it again in five years though, because you don't know what happens, right? It's something that we just don't do and forget, right? Five years later, you go, you know what? Add these tests into my thing. I just want to make sure that I'm still good. Right. So this is a different approach. So this is being Very. proactive. And I love this approach. I think it's so, and really it's about taking your health in your own hands and, and, and being empowered with, by your yes. own health and not just being told, yeah, you're fine. Um, come back, you know, when you, when you're sick, you know, <laughs> exactly. Right. That's what this woman who reversed her Hashimoto's in four months was told when she went in and her blood sugar was like 
111 or 12. And they said, huh, you're heading towards diabetes. And she says, ah, mother had it, uncle had it. They had real severe complications. I don't want diabetes. What do I do? And they said, come back in six months. We'll check you again. And if you're heading, if you are, you know, continuing to progress to diabetes, we'll put you on medication. And she said, no, that's not acceptable. She took her health in her own hands. She was 65. She wasn't like, you know, in her 20s. Um, she reversed it. And now she's in her 70s. And she's like, working and feeling great and teaching yoga and meditation. And, you know, this is what the life can be, right? Right. That's the life that we want. We, yes. we want to be able to just, I mean, I feel like I keep feeling better as I get older. I do too. People say that to me like, what? You're crazy. I'm like, no, I don't. What do you mean? Oh yeah. The aches and pains you get when you're in your sixties, fifties and sixties. I'm like, what, are, what's that? Like your energy that goes down and you get way weight, weight. I'm like, really? We don't have that issue. Why? It's not that we have good genes. It's that we've taken on a lifestyle that supports us in being optimally well and creating balance in our bodies. Right. So let's talk about that lifestyle. Yeah. So now, and of course, if somebody does these tests and it, it shows that they're not optimal, then yeah. they really need to be a little bit more proactive. They need to be a little yeah. you know, more vigilant and uh, about this, but really living, you know, eating healthy and balancing your blood sugar is something that we should all do. Right. Everybody. Yep. What are some of the big things that you think are super important for um, balancing blood sugar with the diet? Absolutely. So first of all, it's avoiding those foods that spike it. And you know what? Here's the thing. There's a glycemic index and you can look it up, but that's not going to be universal. I mean, certain things will be, but I know people who can just eat from the sugar bowl and their sugar doesn't go up. So it's not really universal, but it's very different from person to person. So what I found, sugar, foods that spiked my sugar were pineapple and mango, two of my favorite foods. But my blood sugars were going into the 160s after I ate them. That's not good, right? Every time my sugar's going up, there's a little more damage to my retinas and my peripheral nerves and my arteries. And that's the part that scared me because everybody in my family died of heart disease. So, right. Um, so you have to avoid the, you have to avoid the bad stuff, right? The quote unquote bad stuff that we all agree, like hydrogenated oils, heated processed oxidized fats, um, processed foods that are just white flour, whatever, the bagels and the whatever, um, the processed stuff, the obvious stuff. But then we have to look at what's our ideal diet, right? I don't eat pineapple unless I eat it with a big salad. Because if I eat it with a big salad, I can eat my little pieces of pineapple and my sugar doesn't go up. Why am I so sensitive? Well, I look at genes too. I have lots and lots of genes that predispose to diabetes and obesity and heart disease. So I'm going to be more careful or need to be more careful than somebody who doesn't have that. But overall, it's avoiding the, really, it's re, you know, eat real food and eat food that's in the glycemic range that your body tolerates, right? So some, some people in my program, they, they, they try and they can get this much apple into their diet, you know, but before they couldn't get any of that in. So we take people through what we call metabolic reset, a, a hormone receptor metabolic reset that not only helps reset the insulin receptors to make them more sensitive, but it also helps other hormones. And that's a whole nother topic for another day about hormone resistance and hormone receptor problems. But overall, when people make these changes and they optimize their diet to their particular set of uh, findings, it's great. But if you're just going to start out, it's eat those whole real foods, lots and lots of vegetables, good whole foods, plant-based fats that haven't been processed like avocados and olives and nuts and seeds and nut butters and things like that, that you can add to your diet and add to your vegetables to make them amazing. And as much fruit as your body allows, and then grains tread lightly with, and because a lot of people have grain intolerance. We see a lot of people do well on a paleo diet and a keto diet, but some people don't, right? So it's really a matter of how do you respond to it? Um, yeah, and, and organic as much as possible, obviously, because those are hormone disruptors. They will, they're endocrine system disruptors. And then from an, the other standpoint, though, it's not just about diet, because I do see people eating really well, but they're still having problems. And we have to look at the other lifestyle factors like stress, like the amount of sleep people are getting hugely related to blood sugar imbalances and uh, hunger and over at, overeating because when you don't get enough sleep, you increase ghrelin, decrease leptin, and you're like, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat everything. 
really bad. And then fitness, you know, keeping the right level of fitness and, and stress management and, and how you time everything because so many people are doing the old fashioned uh, eat every two hours to maintain your blood sugar. And that's the worst thing you can do for blood sugar balance. So all of those things play in. Yeah. So let's talk about that because that is something that um, I think when I came out of naturopathic medical school, that was kind of a trend, like you need to eat throughout the day um, and, and you should be, you shouldn't wait more than three hours to eat. Right. So uh, what, when did that change? I mean, you know, it's been interesting to see, there's definitely been a big change in that. Yes. So, so tell, let's talk about that. Like, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah. So it didn't change from a standpoint of it being a bad idea. It's <laughs> always been a bad idea. When you look at the biochemistry, and physiology. So when we think about this, insulin, which gets secreted when we eat anything, really, because it's what helps to get the, the fuel into the cells, insulin gets secreted when we eat. Insulin is what's called a fat storage hormone. It's, a, it's an anabolic hormone. You cannot burn fat in the presence of elevated levels of insulin. So if people are trying to get to their optimal weight, does it make sense to have insulin elevated in the system all day long? Because what you're basically doing is putting the brakes on fat burning, right? And we need that break in between meals for the insulin levels to go down, growth hormone levels to come up, leptin levels to signal satiety. And so we just use stored fuel if we have it, right? If we're trying to lose weight. Um, and the exception is people who are like really underweight with high metabolisms do need to eat more often. I will give you that. But it's been told to the people who need to lose weight. And they're going, why is this not working? And sometimes all I do is say, let's just spread your meals out from every two to three hours to every five to six hours. Just try that this week and see what happens. And people come in and like, well, <laughs> it worked, right? Because you get the levels of insulin down and you're, allowed, you're allowing the levels of growth hormone to come up and growth hormone burns fat and stores lean. Who do you want elevated throughout your day? The one that's going to store fat or the one that's going to burn it? Personally, I want the one that's going to burn it. Right. And it also has to do with what you're eating when you're eating every yes. two hours. So. Yes. And yes. Because if you're eating celery sticks every two hours, the amount it's going to raise your insulin is slim to none. You know, it's not going to do that. But once you add foods that have more of a carbohydrate content, even some of the nuts and seeds, right? They have a balance of fat, protein, carbohydrate. Yes, it's more fat than protein and carbohydrate, but they still have that. Like cashews have more than other nuts. So, and coconut has more carbohydrate, even though it's very high fat, it's mostly fat and carbohydrate. So you have to look at that and that's where the testing it really helps. So, but having, if you like, I cannot stand this, I just need to put something in my tummy, high fiber, high water content, um, locale, We'll, we'll do the trick. And so I have what I call the snack attack strategy. So if you absolutely can't make it to your next meal, here's your hierarchy of what you can include to try to break that. But a lot of people get hungry because it's habitual. And a lot of people get hungry because they're thirsty. And so I always tell people, satisfy the thirst, make sure you drink some water first. And if you're still hungry and half an hour later, use my snack attack strategy and figure out what to eat. Right. And sometimes it's emotional or, or boredom. Emotional, big time. Yes. Mm -hmm. any, any suggestions on that? I mean, I guess you can just, you know, you eat some of those foods to just satisfy that, you know, I'm eating something, but it's celery and it's not. Yeah. yeah so that how many people do you know that get emotional eating cravings for celery or broccoli, right. for that matter, <laughs> right? Or kale. It's usually they want those, those, you know, either the crunchies or the sweet. <clears throat> And so that's dealing with the emotions. Like I, I have a, an emotional eating strategy that I give people as well. I say, okay, stop yourself. Okay, oh, I feel hungry. Stop, tune in. Is it hunger or is it thirst? Okay, and let me just try some water. Is it hunger, true hunger, like my body needs fuel and nourishment or is there an emotional component to this? So is it real, true physiologic hunger or is it an emotional need? And if it is, what are you needing right now? Are you lonely? Um, are you sad? Uh, are, are you feeling deprived? Are you frustrated? What's the emotion? And then how can you deal effectively with the emotion, whether it's call a friend or take a bath or meditate or something, but just to even the stopping and evaluating, is it really? Really hunger. I do that myself. You know, I get frustrated and I'll, I grab a bar. It's a good, healthy protein bar. And I'm like, what did you just do? Are you hungry? 
Like, no. Are you frustrated? Yes. Okay. How are you going to deal with the frustration? And is eating the bar going to help you with that feeling? And then we create strategies and there's some, you know, great programs out there. Um, one of our, one of our uh, colleagues, um, Trisha Nelson has a great program for helping people with emotional eating and there's others out there. So you might need that support, but the first thing is to recognize, am I eating right now? Am I feeling hunger because I'm trying to satisfy an emotional craving and then just, you know, have strategies to walk down that, that path. Yeah, that's a great, a, a great, a great tip. And definitely having those strategies and, um, because being able to identify is a trick and then having the tools is another thing. Another right? thing, right. It's like, yeah, I'm not hungry and I'm frustrated. And I'm going to eat that bar anyway. Because <laughs> right? well, you, know, you, know, you don't beat yourself up about it. Just like, like let's see. Exactly. It. <laughs> it's like, I'm doing it and I'm doing it and I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And so when we talk about sugar, are there alternatives to sugar that you yeah. recommend for people so that, you know, if you, you know, you do get a little bit of like, I want a little bit as a treat of some sort. Yes. What, what, what do you think is okay? Or what do you think is a good stuff? Yeah, I, absolutely. And I, I do that, you know, if I'm in the middle of a launch and I'm in the middle of lots of work and I'm like, I'm not getting my outdoor time. I'm not getting my downtime. I just want chocolate. So I will, you know, get some raw cacao powder and I'll mix it with some almond butter or coconut butter and then I sweeten it. And I, it's a simple thing I can do in 30 seconds. Unfortunately, it's quick, so I can do it more often than I probably should. Um, but then I sweeten it either with um, stevia and either the green stevia, not the white processed stuff is not as good, but green stevia, uh, which is just dehydrated stevia, which is a plant, a leaf, or those drops. Sweet drops has a really nice little no added sugar or anything. It's just stevia. And you could just put butterscotch flavored sweetness to it or chocolate flavored or vanilla. And then um, uh, lohan is another one, monk fruit. That's getting more popularity these days, a Chinese herb, um, but it's got that sweetness to the tongue, but no calories. Um, erythritol, not everybody can tolerate because it's one of the sugar alcohols. So some people with gut imbalances can't, um, but most people can tolerate erythritol, but not xylitol. So those are all options and they give the food a sweetness. I've made people candies and cookies and pies and I made ice cream yesterday, um, which was really amazing. And I just, I just mixed in, um, I blended up some nuts and made a nut milk. And I added some protein powder, chocolate flavored collagen support protein powder. And I put that in there and I didn't even need sweetener because that had some stevia in it. And I blended it up and put it in an ice cream maker. And an hour later, I had this amazing chocolate ice cream that was really healthy for me, right? I went through broccoli sprout powder in there as well to give it some greens. So there's a lot of really cool ways that you can trick your taste buds into thinking they're eating their old favorite because ice cream's always been my favorite and to eating their old favorite, but it's in a way that's going to support you, not just from a blood sugar, but from a weight and from a hormonal perspective. Right. All right. Perfect. What do you think about coconut sugar? I have had people that have coconut sugar added to something and it doesn't do anything to their blood sugar. I've also seen people put coconut sugar in and it spikes their blood sugar. It actually has carbohydrate and it's considered low glycemic, but it's not for everybody. So it's a, it's one of those, try it and see if it works for you. But if you're not testing your blood sugar and you have issues with fatigue or hormone imbalance or excess weight, don't do it. Just get these, these non caloric ones. Yeah, because I've seen a lot of uh, like paleo desserts and things um, contain coconut sugar. So um, yeah, and if you look at the grams of sugar in there, they're higher than I think they I would want to put in my body. Right. So I can use it. But lohan, really nice. It's just it's, it's just a plant that's got this sweet taste that tricks your taste buds into thinking it's sweet, but it doesn't provide any calories, and it actually provides some protective effects like stevia on the dental and like xylitol, all of those on the flora in the mouth. So it helps to protect teeth. Yeah, that's great. And so these don't increase blood sugar. They don't impact the blood sugar where something like coconut sugar or honey or maple syrup. Oh, yeah, they'll raise the blood sugar. They all raise the blood sugar because people ask me about these all the time. Like I know you're saying, you know, sugar, but what about these other things? What about honey? Honey come, you know, comes from nature. Like what what about? It does, but it doesn't mean it's going to be good for you. <laughs> Tobacco comes from nature. All right. Yeah. It's not. Uh, arsenic, they all come from nature. 
right, right. Mold. <laughs> Mold, right, exactly. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think it is important for people to look at labels because I think we're starting, yes. a lot of people get used to, oh, it's paleo or it says it's gluten-free or it says it's- Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. No sugar added or something like that to actually look at the label and look at, you're saying look at the, the, the grams of sugar, right? Exactly. Like even like people are drinking kombucha, right? Oh, kombucha. Well, some of them have one gram of sugar per eight ounces and some of them have 12. So if you drink that 16 ounce bottle of kombucha, that's 24 grams of sugar, right? And that's crazy into one drink. That could shoot the sugars up way, way, way high. Okay. And really I, know, I know you're not a fan of artificial sweeteners, but can you tell, explain p people a little bit about why artificial why? sweeteners are not a, a good alternative? Yeah. So artificial anything is probably not a good idea. We shouldn't muck with nature, but that's been found that those artificial sweeteners actually affect microbiome changes. So, and they actually stimulate some of the, the cravings for more sweet than like the others and some of them like what's the one sucralose um you may get anal anal uh leakage from it sorry i don't want sweet enough to risk anal leakage thank you very much mm -hmm. right so yeah those are why why bother because right now it's so easy to get stevia xylitol um or uh, lohan it's it's all over the place like 10 years ago, people didn't really hear of them. But right now, it's kind of like probiotics. They're all the rage. You can get how many brands of, you know, unsweetened, very good probiotics, sauerkrauts, yogurts, et cetera, over the counter now, whereas 10 years ago, it was really hard, right? You had to make your own. So it's so easy. Like, why bother with sucralose when you can put xylitol or, well, not xylitol, but uh, stevia or lohan or erythritol in there? Yeah. And there's a couple of others that are that have some like in inulin. Um, you can get an inulin, a separated inulin, which is a prebiotic. But people with gut issues do have to be careful about some of the prebiotics. So if you tend towards irritable bowel or bloating or gas after you eat, the inulin kind of things may contribute to that. Mm -hmm. And that would come from Jerusalem artichokes or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So if you're having those issues, you might want to have have that addressed. And usually, if you get that. And better in balance than you can then you can do it right anytime i say people say that certain things like that cause them gut problems we got to get the gut in balance mm -hmm. it's not yeah. the food's fault mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so when people follow the the diet that you're recommending what do they notice with their bodies i mean we talked before about aches and pains going away and having better energy mm -hmm. but what about like the skin, what do you notice with 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 people's skin when oh it's amazing people will say oh my god my Skin is glowing. People keep telling me my skin is glowing. They see things, you know, some have rashes and things. Rashes are an indication that there's an imbalance in the body and the detox mechanisms aren't working properly. And sugar feeds the bad gut flora, the ones we don't want. So we see people's skin clear. We see them say, oh my God, my, my friends are telling me I look 10 years younger. And it's amazing stuff. People actually post sometimes the picture, their pre and their post. They're like, look at this. This is like two months later and look at how much different I look. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I just think of skin as being such a good indicator of that. The internal, it's an internal barometer. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And it can be one of the first signs that oh, you're going in the right direction with the changes with your skin. And that's a really good sign. Yes. A lot of that inflammation, people will talk about like, why do I have, you know, like puffiness? Why do I wake up and I feel puffy and um, you know, all of that, that just the swelling, the irritation, so much right. I feel like is sugar. So mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's great. So I do want to ask, I know a lot of people ask me about this. What about um, alcohol? What about wine, beer, cocktails? Because I think a lot of times people think, okay, they don't even associate that with food and drinks. It's like this whole other thing. And they go, they'll put all kinds of stuff in like their cocktails or so uh, what do you, what do you recommend when it comes to having uh, a glass of wine or something like that? Abstain. <laughs> I'm not popular on my views on alcohol. A couple of things. Um, alcohol, first of all, gets into the system and raises 
does the similar things. It may not raise the sugar per se, but has similar effects as raised sugar as um, sugar, more so. It's quickly, it's very quickly absorbed. It goes into the liver very quickly. And it will actually, you know, it, it can more of a cause of fatty liver than anything else. So I, I say abstain because it's like eating pure sugar. It's like yeah. eating pure sugar. Plus it damages brain cells. You know, every drink you take, you're damaging brain cells. I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to lose any of my brain cells. I drank my way through college and high school and that was enough, you know, enough damaged brain cells. I'm going to preserve them now. But yeah, I don't think alcohol is a good thing. And especially the cocktail thing, right? That you're putting all this sweetened crap in it. I'm totally opposed to alcohol. Okay. All right. And I see a lot of people who are in the natural health movement. Oh, it's organic. Well, the uh, organic or not organic wasn't the problem. Sure, it's a little better that way, but there's, it's still high sugar food and it's a high glycemic food and it's going to throw your blood sugar off and it's going to create you know, problems. It may not even create that big an insulin spike, but it creates similar to fructose where it doesn't raise the sugar, but it affects the liver pathways. Right, and it also can play into um, difficulties with sleep and um, abilities to manage stress and things like that that are also tying into, like you mentioned, Absolutely. tying into yeah. the ability to balance our blood sugar, balance our hormones. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that there's some currently illegal substances that are healthier than alcohol if you really want to buzz. Just saying. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'm, you know, at least they're the blood <laughs> <laughs> okay. Doesn't affect your blood sugar level okay. and actually can have some beneficial effects. But we oh, won't wait, 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 I might have to have you back on in another conversation. <laughs> Talk about that. We'll wait till it gets more globally legal. But it's happening. I'm I'm not, I'm not an I don't I don't um, partake of that either, but I'm saying it's an it's a it's a healthier alternative. It's a safer alternative for dr traffic accidents, et cetera, although you shouldn't drive when you're under the influence at all. It's better on your liver. And, you know, it's crazy that people are thinking alcohol is such this great thing and just everybody drinks it with their meals. It's not. I don't, I'm very anti-alcohol. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, Rita Marie, it's been so great having you on. So tell everybody where they can find you, where they can learn more about you. And then you also have a free gift for us. As oh, well. I do. I love that free gift. You're going to love it. Um, <clears throat> I'm at drritamarie.com. And uh, we have lots of free resources there. And we have a lot of programs that, you know, guide you through hormonal changes. And then um, as far as the free gifts, it's hormone hacking breakfast menus. And it's breakfast menus I put together that can be either done first thing in the morning or for you people who are intermittent fasting, which I do, you can have your breakfast at two or one or 12 or whatever time. But it's an idea of how do you eat a first meal of the day that breaks your fast that's balanced in terms of omega-3s and helps your gut flora and fiber and micronutrients and protein all balanced into a breakfast. And we have five different menu plans. We have the components of a healthy breakfast and there's probably like 20 recipes in there to help you get started. And they're amazing recipes. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much for, for the yeah. gift. And and I'll see you soon at, at Mindshare, a bunch of our- That's right. I can't wait to see you there. Yay. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Rita Marie. You can learn more about her by going to thespadoctor.com, going to the podcast page with her interview, and you'll find all the information and links there, including the free gift that she mentioned. And while you're there at thespadoctor.com, I encourage you to join the Spa Doctor community so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't taken the skin quiz yet, this is a great opportunity to find out what messages your skin is trying to tell you about about your health and what you can do about that. And that might even be some of those blood sugar imbalances that we talked about today. You just go to theskinquiz.com to find out what messages your skin's trying to tell you about your health. Also, I invite you to join me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and YouTube, and join the conversation there. And I'll see you next time on the Spot Doctor Podcast.